Hi there, I'm Corey. And I'm Lane. If y'all are looking for a little American magic, then put away your athames and wands and dig out your box of roots, stones, and bones. This is New World Butchery. In this episode, we have an interview with renowned root worker Kat Ironwood. In witchcraft, we're going to discuss soap making and its magical uses. And in Spelled Out, we'll talk about cleansing and purification baths. On New World Witchery with us today, we have a real treat. Uh, We have one of the premier authorities in Hoodoo today discussing the subject with us. She is the proprietress of the Lucky Mojo uh, website, shop, uh, as well as dozens of other sites, uh, some of which we'll name here in just a minute. Um, But uh, I'd like to say a very warm welcome and a very big thank you to our guest, Kat Ironwood. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for agreeing to it. All right. Well, first of all, uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about your shop and your other sites. Um, you've got LuckyMojo.com, I know. Southern Spirits, which I spend a lot of time reading. Yeah, Southern Spirits is a sort of an academic repository of 19th and early 20th century material about African-American folk man. Mm-hmm. And it's Southern hyphen Spirits, yes. <laughs> just for those who are looking it up, dot .com. And I have another one, Herb Magic, herb-magic.com, which is all about the use of herbs in Mm -hmm. hoodoo. And um, at Lucky Mojo, there are a bunch of subsites. Back in the day when it was very difficult to buy domains, I had to make them all subsites of one domain. Now you can buy a domain for nothing. But since everyone built links to those subdomains, I've kept them. So luckymojo.com slash sacredsex.html is a sacred sex website that's fully contained within Lucky Mojo. There's another one, luckymojo.com slash luckyw.html, which is a site, a fully contained site on um, lucky charms and amulets from around the world. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I have arcanearchive.com, which is a, a cache of posts, mostly from Usenet and from old bulletin boards back in the 80s and 90s uh, on the subjects of magic, worldwide magic, Mm -hmm. ceremonial magic, folk magic, and different religions and mysticism. I have another site called the mystictearoom.com. Mystic Tea Room is about tea leaf reading. Uh, We we really are kind of have a lot of these things. (laughs) We've we've done a lot of them. (laughs) And they're all fantastic. I've spent a lot of time on the various sites, um, and you've just done such a great job with that. There's another one, ironwood.org, which is spelled like our last name, Y-R-O-N-W-O-D-E dot O-R-G, which is the official outlet for the Ironwood Institution for the Preservation and Popularization of Indigenous Ethnomagicology, which is YIPI. That's, <laughs> that's an acronym, YIPI. Mm-hmm. And that is a nonprofit. And what's it at ironwood.org is mostly bibliographies on books on magic, bibliographies, books on dowsing, uh, books on Ouija boards, whatever. And these are just sort of academic site for people who want to, you know, get uh, primary source information and need a bibliography. That's wonderful. That's I, I, You've told me something that's probably going to occupy most of my time now for the coming week. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love those kinds of things. Um, oh, and you also run the Missionary Independent Spiritual Church. Is that correct? That's correct. Missionary Independent Spiritual Churches is a small denomination of spiritualist new thought churches that have, there are two churches in our denomination. The other one, it, first the, the, the mother church is missionary independent, and then the the newest um, church is Four Altars Gospel Sanctuary, which is in Joshua Tree, California. Hmm. And these are small churches where we set candles and lights. We're run by a regular board of bishops. Bishop Fred Burke is in charge of the other church, the one in Joshua Tree in the desert. And we baptize people. We do weddings, funerals, um, and so forth. And we set lights. We do spiritual contact with spirits of the dead or with angels on behalf of people. And we do divination of all types, um, including scrying with crystal balls, tarot cards, and, and other forms of spiritualist mediumship. And we also have an organization called the Crystal Silence League, which is a method by which we send out affirmative prayers and healing prayers to people who themselves have a crystal ball. And all we need to do is attune our crystal ball to their crystal ball, and we send out prayers for them. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And that's that's accessible through the Lucky Mojo website as well? 
Well, yes, it has its own website. It's um, missionaryindependent.org. And uh, mm-hmm. we're, we're one of many, many spiritualist churches in America. We're just a very small denomination. But we also use a lot of new thought type things, too. Uh, in other words, affirmative prayer and, and uh, that kind of stuff. And we happen to be, the church itself happens to be the smallest church in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've been listed that way. There's a company called, uh, an outfit called RoadsideAmerica.com, and they've listed us as the smallest church in the world, which we are. So people come by just to see us for that reason, without any regard to the, the spiritual work we do. And the church is right next door to Lucky Mojo, which is the shop, which is an old-fashioned hoodoo candle shop. And it's somewhat in the nature of a, well, you know, it's kind of a, it's a real functional candle shop. I mean, we have 10 people, we're making things all day long, we make oils powders, incenses. We make everything for people on the spot. We have candles and um, Cheerios of all types, books, tarot cards, you name it, it's a regular shop. But it also is um, outfitted as a historical reenactment shop. In other words, if you went to Colonial Williamsburg to buy a candle, you'd be getting something in that, you know, which came out of that time period. And what we've done here is recreate an old-fashioned candle shop of the 1920s or 30s. How did you manage to find all the the sort of original material to base that on? Well, I'm a collector, and I'm a, I'm a graphic designer and a writer. And I've, been, I've worked in the comic book business for about 26 years. I'm very sensitive to art, and I, mm-hmm. um, I began looking for original artwork. Wherever you see something printed, a label or something, there's original art. And I collected original art for advertising art and... Um, poster art. I have quite a collection of it just for my own pleasure. And some of the art that was done for some of these older um, hoodoo or conjure supplies out of Chicago and out of Memphis, the artwork is available. I mean, you can find it. Some of the best art was done by a a graphic designer and artist named Charles Dawson. He was an African-American painter and um, and a a fine arts gallery type painter. And when the Depression came, he went into commercial art because you know, he needs to earn money to support his family. Mm-hmm. And I collect Charles Dawson's art, so I began cleaning it up, you know, um, photographing it, cleaning it up, and putting it on labels. It's out of trademark and out of copyright. Uh, it's been so long. And I, I would redesign it. Sometimes I would, uh, you know, change things around. It's found art. And I began to just create these labels that looked like they came from the 1920s and 30s. I also hired artists, um, people I know, Steve Lealoa, for instance, Trina Robbins, people I know in the comics business who can draw in an old style, and I would just give them an assignment to draw me a label that looked like it came from the 20s or 30s, and they did. And the labels look great. They're so vivid. They just, they pop right off the products. Well, thank you. Beautiful. That's just, that's just part of my, you know, my, my basic skill set from working in comics and working as a graphic designer and a, and in, Typography. I've done that for a long time. I've been a typesetter. Oh, neat! So I love that kind of stuff. My my wife loves that quite a bit too. She uh, she gets very into fonts. So yeah, I'm a neat. font freak. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, like uh, Cobble Ultra is our um, you know the font that we use on most of our labels. And you know, people go, "What are you talking about?" Oh, it's Cobble <laughs> Ultra. But all of the recipes that we got at, and that at the, that type of stuff came out of my uh, lifelong collection of folklore and folk medicine. I'm a, just a collector of, of information. And, you know, I would write down formulas that people would give me or watch them make something in their shop, and I'd write down what I think they were making it, and then I would test it at home. You know, you can do perfume testing with tester strips, and you can see how close you are to copying mm-hmm. what someone else has. And I started doing that back in the 1960s so that I would have um, access to different formulas. And, I, you know, it's like, does everyone make money drawing oil the same way? The answer is no. And so I got a lot of different formulas for money drawing oil, and I would just sort of play around with them. And so a lot of the formulas that we use are very old-fashioned. They, a lot of them come out of my own past of collecting. And in some cases, I interviewed older people who had worked in the hoodoo business, the, the business of running an occult shop, back as early as the 20s, and asked them for formulas. If they were retired, they would sometimes give them to me. So the idea was to keep something traditional going. And I think the earliest of our formulas for the oils go back to the 19th century. So how did you how did you get into hoodoo and folk magic? Did you have a family connection to that already or is it just something that you that you got really fascinated by? Well, I'm a what's called a polymath, if you know what that is. That's a person who is interested in multiple things. Mm-hmm. And um, 
so I'm an unusual person. I'm, this is not to boast or brag. I'm just trying to explain myself as if I were a specimen. Um, <laughs> when when okay. dealing with me, people often say, gee, she's like someone with Asperger's. I think that may be a pretty good, pretty accurate. I'm, I'm not like an average person. I just, I have to explain that because people say, how did you get into that? You might as if easily ask me, and I have recently been interviewed, how did you get into comic books? How did you get into uh, collecting um, teacups? Whatever. Um, I can't explain it other than to say I've always been like this. Now, mm -hmm. as far as my family background, I come from a family that is bohemian and academic. On my mother's side, um, German Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, with family names like Erlinger and Kohn and Reichenstein and so forth. Um, from around Nuremberg and then Munich. On my father's side, Sicilians, who probably were conversos, probably were Jews, but had become Catholic when uh, 1492, when uh, Spain owned Sicily, and they made a rule that all the Jews had to either convert or leave. Um, the last names, Jean Grosso, Manfredi, Prococo, these are just, you know, um, Sicilians. But they look more Jewish than they look Italian. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, my father was an artist and um, very left-wing politically. My mother was a poet and a librarian and a writer and very left-wing politically. They met. They had me. My grandfather was a, a lawyer, a trademark and copyright lawyer. And um, he was interested in folklore. That was his hobby. He, he was Jewish, but his hobby was Christian folklore. He had a huge collection hmm. of Catholic Bavarian folk art. I mean, vast museum quality stuff. That was his hobby. And he encouraged me to collect folklore from, as he put it, your little playmates. And mm, so I, collect, mm -hmm. I collected folklore from my little playmates. And I happened to grow up in a town called Berkeley, California, which was multiracial, multicultural. A lot of people came there for the university. My mother worked at the university as a librarian. Uh, when I was young, she was going to library school there. And we lived in an area where a lot of the students, the graduate students, lived with their children. And so there were people from all different cultures. There was a little boy who only spoke Russian who showed up, you know, and there was uh, Mexican Americans. And the, these would have been um, families who had been in California prior to the making of California State. Mm -hmm. There were uh, a lot of African Americans whose families had come to Berkeley and Oakland um, during World War II to work in the shipyards. These were families from the Gulf area, Louisiana, Alabama, uh, Mississippi, Texas. They had shipbuilding or ship repair uh, skills, and they were moved up to Richmond and, and Oakland to work in the sh shipyards. And so they, their children, who are my age, were there in school. And there were um, a lot of, just a lot of children. There were Chinese um, uh, children. Uh, their, their families had, when, when Mao took over China as a communist country, the scientists and, and Chinese uh, people interested in democracy you know, came to America. So we were in a very unusual place uh, with a lot of uh, children of university students and, um, and graduates. So my grandfather telling me, collect the folklore of your little playmates meant a lot of different kinds of folklore. Mm -hmm. And I, I became kind of obsessed with it. Um, he pointed out to me that there would be jump rope rhymes that would differ by the children's races and skin colors and cultures, and that some would not even have jump rope rhymes, and that there would be different hopscotch, and they would call hopscotch potsy or hopscotch or some other different name for it. And he kind of showed me that, and I kind of went wild with it. And, um, and then I also am a musical obsessive, and um, my family on my mother's side are all musical obsessives. It, it's pretty humorous, actually. We're, mm -hmm. we're just totally obsessed with music. And... Um, so as a musical obsessive, I chose a form of music which was not real popular in my family, which was solidly in the camp of Mozart, and um, and I went off into um, blues music mm -hmm. and, um, and early country music. And because of that, I wanted to buy a rhythm and blues music that I heard on the radio on KDIA Lucky 13, which was a black-owned station in Oakland. And then to do that, I had to go down to Oakland to buy the records. And um, to save money on the bus fare, I walked. And while walking, I walked by a shop that had a sign on it that said, Candles, Spiritual Supplies, with a little image like a little leaf between the word candles and spiritual supplies. It was hand-lettered on the glass. And I walked in to see what that was, because that sounds real odd. You know, candles, spiritual supplies, didn't get it. So 
I walked in and um, realized I was in a shop of, of a kind I'd never been in before, and I was about 14 years old. So I asked around, and I, they were very friendly to me, and I told them what I could buy and what was there. And I started going back every Saturday. I'd go buy a record, and then I'd, um, you know, some Slim Harpo record from Louisiana or something, and then I'd, I'd buy these um, country supplies. Later, I was writing a book on Lucky Charms, and I happened to write a... Um, a page about John the Conquer Root, just mentioning it was a lucky charm of the African-American mm-hmm. um, you know, culture in America. And I think this was along with things on the evil eye and, and things on, you know, Maneke Neke, the, the little good luck kitty, the, the beckoning cat. cat. Mm-hmm. It was like part of a much larger world folklore, material culture of world folklore, more or less cataloging my collection of thousands and thousands and thousands of good luck charms. So I put this one up, but it had not been up for about a week when a woman phoned me and asked me if I could get her a John the Conquer route. And I thought, that's odd. She was black. She was from the South. She was working for the U.S. government in Washington, D.C. And I said, why don't you just go down, get one at Cloverhorn, because I happen to know there was a place in Washington, D.C. that sold it. She goes, well, that's in a kind of a bad part of town now, and I don't go down there. She goes, could you send me one? I said, sure. I sent her one for free. She mm-hmm. called me right back, and she said, can you send me 10 of them? <laughs> and I said, well, then I'd have to buy them and sell them. So I decided to buy them and sell them, and that's what led to Lucky Mojo. And um, at the time, I did some searches on the World Wide Web, and I found that um, Alta Vista was the only search engine back then. This was before Google. Mm-hmm. And the word hoodoo appeared nowhere on the World Wide Web, which I thought was odd. The word conjure appeared, but it usually was in the reference to stage magic or just the word to meaning something to appear suddenly. Mm-hmm. The word witchcraft was used mostly by neo-pagans. Um, and the word root work mostly either applied to chakra work, uh, the root chakra, or it applied to um, computer work, you know, mm-hmm. uh, root work. And so I picked the word hoodoo of all of those words that I knew being the rarest word I could then judge my progress on Alta Vista. So I began to, to I mean, cause the words conjure, root work, hoodoo, they're used somewhat interchangeably, and even witchcraft and mm-hmm. uh, sorcery. So I just began to write about it to see what would happen, and um, suddenly there were pages and pages of my work that were being cataloged by these search engines and nobody else's work. And it was almost three years before the word hoodoo appeared with somebody else's web pages. And now it's become very popular. Now everybody mm-hmm. talks about, oh, who do this, and cats miss who do that, and whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's just kind of one of those funny things. You know, it was sort of an experiment to see if I could reflect back into the world and bring into the... You see, as everything was converting to electronic and digitized, you don't want to lose parts of culture. So I thought, I'll be the champion of this piece of culture which is not represented. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely, and I think you've done I mean, an amazing job. Thing, I, I have to explain here about me. Had it been, there had been no articles on, on um, 16th century Spanish literature, and I happened to know about it, I would have started a big website on that, but I don't happen to know about that one. <laughs> That's not, that's not part of the poly math, the poly math well, skills. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, actually, I, I don't, I'm not too good with other languages. I'm just into English. But, you know, mm-hmm. but for instance, that the whole thing on the Lucky Charms was part of this program of bringing things into the digital age. The, I have a, this whole site on sacred sex. I, 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 all these different sites that I built were really about um, downloading the content of my brain onto what I perceived as a very good new system. Mm-hmm. Sort of an archiving project. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I I sometimes feel like I have been replaced by Google, although Google is not yet as connective as me. But before Google, people just would phone me at random. And what's the recipe for hot sauce? Or how do you do this? You know, um, how do you trim a kerosene lamp? I'm a person who currently knows all this stuff. <laughs> That's and, um, fantastic. And, it, well, yeah, it's just a kind of mentality. There's other people like me. I mean, I'm not alone, and I'm not unique in any way. I'd say about 1% of people on the, in the world have this capacity, maybe less, maybe a lot less. I don't know, but I like to think that 1% of us are out here. But anyway, I have that capacity, and so I thought with this um, exobiological thing, with the, with the with digitizing, why well, we, could put, we could put, put everything together, and then when search engines came along, and especially when Google came along, which was quite a bit into this project for me, I went, this is perfect because now anyone can find anything, and I can die content. They no longer need to phone me in my grave and ask me what's the meaning of a Hamsa hand because I've already written it down. Mm-hmm. 
And it's it's fantastic stuff. I mean, the the site is great, and the articles are wonderful. Well, thank you. I, I you know, it's funny. I in some ways, I feel like I've been. You know, people say, "How do you earn a living doing this?" Because they think I do. I don't. I do not earn a living doing this. I just write for twelve hours a day. Mm-hmm. It's just what you feel called to do. Just, I'm sure. It's just what I do. Yeah, it's just me. But I do. I do try to earn a living by teaching courses and the, the hoodoo class is how mm-hmm. I earn a living. The shop is um, truly a nonprofit, although it's not legally a nonprofit yet. I hope to get it there. The shop is a demonstration. Mm-hmm. Of a shop, it's simply to show what a shop is like. You know, you know what I'm saying? Right. It's that historical reenactment aspect that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But meanwhile, it keeps ten people occupied and employed, and and you know, ten thousand people in our database. We really are popular. Right. It's great. You know, it's great. We sell everything at absolutely the lowest price we can. Everything handmade. Everything prayed over. Everything made by students of mine. Learned how to do it the way I was you know, shown how to do it back in the 1960s. And those people that I was running from, you know, they had picked it up in the 20s through 40s. Mm-hmm. The oldest the oldest teacher I have actually, uh, I hate to say, I think he may have passed away by now, but this man was very old. He learned from a man in the 1940s who himself had lived into, the, into his 90s and had been born in slavery. So mm-hmm. I can say that I, I have some legitimate contact with that era of 19th century root work mm. and um and to me that's something to pass along you know i hate it so much that people forget history yes know? yes absolutely. they just don't get it i mean people are so stupid sometimes <laughs> and they you know they just they do the same things over and over and over again same mistakes stubbing their toe on the same rock you know it just drives me nuts so I figured that with, with this new technology, maybe we can learn something, you know. And one of the things we have to learn is what we've done in the past. And so there's no reason to forget anything now. It'll all be remembered. Isn't that great? I love it. I love that. <laughs> um, that's, but, my, that's my goal. <laughs> I think you're doing a great job. Okay, oh, um, getting back to hoodoo a little bit, um, with the cultural identity that you were talking about, you have, like you said at Berkeley, there was that very mixed uh, sort of ethnic background, um, and, and I know that you're one of one of the people who uh, very much says that anyone can do hoodoo. Um, is, is I'm there not a... sure I say that. Well, well, I'm not sure I say that. I'm saying anyone who can anyone can do hoodoo who's willing to enter African American society. Okay, and that's that's uh, something I'd really like I'm, to discuss. Yeah, what... I need to, I need to talk about that because this is something that has been a problem for me. I'm obviously not black. I, I will say out front, when I was young, I pretty much restricted my dating to either Jewish or black guys. That was just my choice. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I branched out. I had a few that were not. You know, and I'm, right now I'm married to a guy who's kind of of a bizarrely, you know, American mixed of mutt or mongrel type mm-hmm. person. A Native American, black, Scots, Irish, Norwegian. But he's probably the most, quote, white guy, unquote, I've ever been with. Um, and, but, you know, so I had a particular interest that was social, that was personal. And I learned about this stuff by being in that culture. Now, that's important to understand. So when I when I said reflecting back, what I really meant was literally reflecting back what I had learned from, from storekeepers, from the old grandmothers, from my friends, from my school friends. I reflected it back as accurately as I could using a skill that I happen to have, which is verbal facility, right? And that's mm-hmm. just a, and also I can make linkages and I've got a really good memory and I can say so and so said this and so and so said that and put them together and say look at how these are similar or different you know that's what I do but I never never intended this to become the plaything of Mm -hmm. neo-pagans and that was never my intention and uh, I didn't even think I didn't think they'd even be interested you know what I mean now Mm -hmm. I have nothing against neo-pagans but what's happened to, to my shock and dismay is that a lot of people have come into this and go, well, oh, hoodoo, anyone can do that. Yes, there are a lot of white people who do hoodoo, but if you look into their families, they're doing Appalachian-type folk magic. But if you look deeper, you'll find that they're almost all part Native American and or a suppressed part black. Mm-hmm. And now the Native American component is what's really been my discovery, that this is pulled out of 
pulling it out of the salad, you know what I mean? Saying, oh, look at this mm -hmm. lettuce leaf. This is different than that other lettuce leaf, right? Mm -hmm. We're not talking about a melting pot. We're talking about a salad, right? So uh, when you think about Africans coming over from Africa as slaves, stripped naked for the most part, they could not bring their herbs and roots with them, but many of them were herb doctors, root doctors, both medically and magically. They had various religions. Some had been converted to Islam. Many of them were Christian, especially from the Congo, because Congo had become Christian in the 1400s. Mm -hmm. And many of them had indigenous religions, um, including the indigenous Congo religion, the indigenous um, Yoruban, indigenous UEFA, and so forth, different, you know. Even some of the early, very earliest slaves in the 1500s came from Ethiopia and were Coptic Christian. I mean, there was a lot of Africa is vast, okay? So there are a lot of different African folk magic traditions and folk religion traditions as varied as, for instance, the difference between a Sicilian and a Norwegian, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're very different. So these all, but they're all stripped naked and they all come over. They have a memory of certain ways of working, but they don't have their herbs or roots. Now, they can't even convince their white masters to bring those herbs or roots over, even if they have, oh, so and so is a doctor, he knows how to set bones. Why can't they bring their herbs and roots over? Because they're tropical. Those will not grow in Colonial Williamsburg right. or, or New York State and or even in the Georgia Sea Islands. So when you are stripped naked and brought to a country and you are expected to do for your people on a plantation, to do the healing, what do you do? You look around, well, who does the healing? It sure ain't the masters because they don't know, right? They're clueless. They, 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 they decide which they're English and come from a different climate and do different things. And they're not going to let you into their thing, but there's Native Americans who are now uh, dispossessed, have no homes. Many of them have been made into slaves. Many of them are still living in an uncivilized, quote-unquote, wild Indian condition out past, you know, in the Ohio Valley or in Kentucky, or they've run away, they've, they've, they've joined Dragging Canoe, and they've gone off to live on the Cumberland Plateau in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And a lot of slaves ran away to join them. So there's a tremendous amount of intermarriage um, between Native Americans and black people in the South, and the Native Americans knew all about the herbs that grew in the South. So when we talk about hoodoo, and I was young, I thought it's all, it's black, it's all from Africa. It is black American, but it's not African. Mm -hmm. It really is, I'd say a good quarter of what's in hoodoo is Native American tricks, Native American routines, Native American use of herbs. Now, a lot of white people have part Native American, and so they contain some of that material, too, in their families. And that's why they look at it and they go, this is so familiar, I'm not black, but why are we doing the same thing? Mm -hmm. They need to look to the Native American component in their own families. And this is the submerged or buried truth that I brought. When I started teaching, I had no idea I was going to find this out. But like my grandfather said, you just watch what your little playmates are doing, and you begin to find out. And so these are not people who would openly declare as Cherokee. In fact, sometimes they're embarrassed and say, well, we're part Native American. I don't know what tribe, but my family was from North Carolina. You know, something like that. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, are you black? Are you white? Are you mixed? Well, we don't know. We don't talk about race in my family. Those people, sometimes referred to as, and you must pardon me for saying this, hillbillies, mm -hmm. sometimes referred to as poor white trash, mm -hmm. those people often carry some of the same magical traditions as African Americans do for various reasons. And um, then there are other components to who do, Jewish components, because of these Jewish shopkeepers, pharmacy owners. Um, who want to be friendly. Oh, you like the Bible too? Well, there, let me tell you something from Psalms. You know, mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden all this work from Psalms, which is Jewish, but magic interests who do. So that's another bit. Then there's Chinese bits where you have, um, like in Oakland, where I grew up, the Chinese ghetto and the and the black ghetto were right next to each other. All of a sudden you have this whole thing, the black exploitation film cult, and you have all these black guys doing kung fu, right? right? Uh -huh. And it's like, they're using Chinese medicines. And you're like, well, that was interesting. And But it also enters into hoodoo. The use of bagua mirrors, for instance. A lot of people, but not everywhere. They won't do that in the Georgia Sea Islands, but they will do it in Oakland and they will do it in New York where the Chinese ghettos and the black ghettos are together. Or the Sicilians. you got the Sicilian fishermen. They're in... San Francisco Bay Area, they're in um, New York, they're in New Orleans, and Sicilians um, are known for being very casual about marrying black people. They don't have a big racist thing going in Sicily. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you'll find a lot of mixed uh, marriages in the 20s, 30s, and 40s at a time when that was considered rather daring or unusual to do, and there were places where this was allowed, and so you'll find a lot of Sicilian folk magic mixed into hoodoo. Just, it's just 
sort of a, 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 a like I said, it's a little salad there with all these different little pieces, and you can pick them apart and go, oh, look at that, that's that's Jewish. Oh, look at that, that's Sicilian. Look at this, this is Native American. But most of the big lettuce leaves are African mm-hmm. and Native American, and of course they're also the Germano British, the, the slave masters. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, they have their own little rhymes and songs and their own little folk ways, and they, t- you know, maybe they teach it to a house slave who then teaches it to her children, and so it ends up in that black family. Mm-hmm. And so we're looking at really the history of America. So now, when people say to me, anyone can do hoodoo, anyone can do hoodoo, but you have to pay respect to the people who kept it going. Mm-hmm. And that was not the white people. They dropped it just like a hot potato. It was not. The Native Americans tended to be walled off and put on reservations in a later time period. The people who kept alive were black people and some very country isolated white identified people who mostly were part Native American, maybe part black. Mm-hmm. Melungeons, they're called. Sometimes. Right, up, up in the Appalachians, the Melungeons. Right, and then right. the, the That's Ozarks. the people who kept this, but, but they don't have as much African. It's always kind of a mix. Is it, you know, when you do a trick, is it been, like if a trick calls for sulfur, you know you're talking something African or Sicilian. If a trick calls for um, Wahoo bark, you know it's Native American. Mm-hmm. You, see? you can look at it, you can take it apart. So we're looking at a very large, um, mixed, you know, people say, well, um, why aren't you studying Santeria? I don't know. I've got interest in Santeria. I've been interested in America. I'm American. Um, but Santeria is some black material mixed with some uh, Spanish material, Catholic, mm-hmm. and it's in Cuba. Right. But it doesn't have the Cherokee component because there are no Cherokee Indians in Cuba. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be different. Jamaican folk magic, Obia, looks more like hoodoo because the people are more of the people are from the Congo than from West Africa. And they're among English speaking slave owners. Uh, but then they don't have the Cherokees again, mm-hmm. or the Caddo Indians, or the Seminoles, or whatever it's going to be. And so there's a little, it's different, but it's very similar. And in fact, by comparing Jamaican and African American, you can see what you can really quickly specialize, like take out the African part and the English part. They, they kind of rise right quick. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also a little bit of Hindu mix in the Jamaican because oh. Britain controlled India and they brought over a lot of Hindus. Oh, I've, I've never thought of that. Yeah, yeah. you gotta, you got to look at the history. It's all about the history. So, But, yeah, so folk magic is worldwide. Anyone can play. I mean, I, could, I can pick up some Taoist thing if I want to. I can, I can pray to a Taoist god and make a Taoist amulet as good as the next white gal, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can, uh, but, but on the other hand, always pay respect to where you got it from. Mm-hmm. I, I, I have to say that I talk with Hindus all the time, and they're like, "Why are all these neo pagans worshiping my god?" I don't know. They thought they thought your god was pretty looking. I don't know. I mean, you know, you have to ask them each individually. But we do have to pay respect, and we don't. We should not say it's all the same thing. It's mm-hmm. not a big stew where everything has been, you know, it's not baby food where everything's been ground down and blanderized into one homogenous mess, mm-hmm. you know. So I teach hoodoo to anybody, and anyone can do hoodoo, but they can't do it well if they don't have black friends and are not understanding uh, mm-hmm. that it is African-American and it is part of black culture in America. Mm-hmm. That's, that's my statement on that. A long answer to a short question. I apologize. But a great answer. Uh, and another thing that I, I know that you've said on other interviews is that to be comfortable with doing hoodoo, you also have to be, I think, comfortable with Jesus was how you uh, how you phrased it? Well, yeah, because after all, what is hoodoo? Hoodoo is not just African magic. If it was just African magic, you could go to Uganda and study it. Right or mm-hmm. Zaire or 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 the Democratic Republic of Congo or South Africa or someplace. You know what I mean? That is not. We're not studying exactly Congo magic or Zulu magic or or Yoruba magic. Or we're studying American mm-hmm. magic. So when you think about African Americans, what's the predominant religion of African Americans? Christianity. What's the predominant denomination? Baptist. I mean, that's a no-brainer. Two mm-hmm. no-brainer questions. Shouldn't even be good enough questions to get on Jeopardy. Everybody knows that, right? <laughs> so Baptist. So now we're talking about Baptists practicing folk magic. Well, that's good. But that's what, you know, but when you, when it's transmitted, it's going to come with prayers. And those prayers usually involve God the Father, God Son, God the Holy Ghost, amen, or in Jesus' name, amen, especially mm-hmm. in Jesus' name, amen. Now, in dealing with Jewish occult shop owners and numbers runners and other uh, pharmacists and other places in which the Jewish folk magical subculture interacted 
restricting places like Harlem, Philadelphia, I mean Harlem, New York City, uh, Philadelphia, Chicago, Memphis. There was a lot of um, that. The Jews tended to, as I say, they want to make friends, and so they, they tend to work what's called, among my black Baptist friends, Old Testament Mm-hmm. Christianity. They don't want to, it's Old Testament magic. Old, you know, so it's a lot of use of the Psalms, and uh, there there are old Jewish, you know, Kabbalistic works on the use of the Psalms, uh, secrets of the Psalms, and so forth. So we see that, and then of course the Baptists tend to add Jesus into the mix. I don't find a problem with it myself. I, I was raised to be, you know, to learn the folklore of all my playmates, and so I, I try to play with everyone. Mm-hmm. But um, I do not accept students in my class anymore. I used to, but it became a problem. I do not accept students in my class who have a problem with black culture or black Christian churches. Mm -hmm. I have no reason to teach those people. Let them go study with Silver Ravenwolf or Mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't have a responsibility to them. My responsibility is to uh, reflect back into black culture, black folk ways. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm here to do. And, I, you know, so if someone says, well, I really like voodoo, but I just don't like Jesus, and I don't like black people, and I don't like, you know, whatever. I mean, I just go, you know, well, it goes with myself. You don't have to study with me. Right. I don't have to serve you. Now, you mentioned the, the neo-pagan interest in hoodoo, and that's something we find a lot on our on our blog, actually. Um mm-hmm. And I've noticed there's just a surge in popularity in these American magical systems. Are you seeing that on your end as well? Oh, yeah. I think, you know, about two or three years ago, hoodoo became, you know, the, the, the you know magic du jour. Uh, I mean, a lot of people began to pick up on it. But this has actually been going on for a lot longer than that. If you go back to the grimoire of Lady Di Sheba, do you know that book? Mm-hmm. I do. It's one of the, the Wiccan, uh, the, the first Wiccan, Wiccan book, book of yeah. shadows. By mm-hmm. Jesse, Jesse Wicker Bell who called herself Lady Sheba. The Grimoire of Lady Sheba was a very early Book of Shadows in the Wiccan tradition, and it contains several hoodoo candle spells. Really? They're right there. Yeah, right there. And they're, they come out of what I would call the Henri Gamache, you mm. know, uh, oracle craftsman style of urban hoodoo, but they're right there. And uh, Anna Riva, who uh, was a, a cult shop owner who worked in a more or less pantheistic style. I mean, she, she did everything. She mm-hmm. used a lot of hoodoo in, in her work, too, and, and served the hoodoo community. So that's kind of an interesting thing that, you know, because Anna Riva stuff was taken up in somewhat by Wiccan. And and um, another one was Sybil Leake. And Sybil Leake, who was a, a British traditional witch, um, came to America. She became friends with a woman named um, Charmaine Day. Uh, now, Charmaine Day was a uh, white girl of um, Polish background. Uh, she was married to a guy named Steve Day, and she had been a um, a stripper, you know, a burlesque stripper. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and Steve Day was a um, a dancer. He did a, a kind of eccentric tap dancing. And they traveled around, and they they they, they, were, they were together, and they, they were in in um, the South at one point, traveling in the South. And she went to a drugstore called the Bichon Drugstore in Houston. This I have, by the way, from a man uh, who was a uh, a student of hers and and worked with her under the name of Tarot Star. Mm. And he published a bunch of, of books uh, of spells. Uh, he he's retired and now lives in Canada. Well, uh, his, his name is um, George Benin. Well, anyway, he's from Ohio. Uh, June Zablowski was her name, June Zablowski Day. She, under the name of Charmaine the Champagne Blonde, had traveled around. And she was in Houston. She went to the Bichon Drugstore. And Bichon Drugstore was a uh, a drugstore that served the hoodoo community in Houston. And she learned how to do this kind of spell work. She ended up in um, Las Vegas, and she opened a shop called Bell Book and Candle. And she was a friend of people like Anna Riva. She, she was very well connected. She published a book called uh, The Magic Candle. It's a very, very popular book on, on uh, hoodoo candle magic. But she was another one of these people, like me, who kind of fell into this thing when I like this. And she wrote some of it down and, and created a, a store built around it. She died in the, in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. Uh, but her influence was very strongly felt because of her publishing this book, The Magic Candle. The point I'm trying to get to here is that she had a huge influence on the neo-pagan community in Las Vegas and elsewhere eventually. Tarot Star, uh, a lot of these people during the uh, 
period when the neo-pagan uh, American uh, groups were branching out from Gardneri and Wicca. Have you ever read um, Aidan Kelly's Craft in the Art of Magic? I've read parts of it, but I haven't read the entire text yet. Well, it's a very, very good book. And also uh, um, uh, uh, Margot Adler's uh, Drawing Down the Moon. Mm-hmm. Those books really tell a story about how what had started off as this kind of lineage-driven uh, Wicca from England kind of spread out into eclectic witchcraft, when so many people found that they themselves had family traditions that were like English family traditions, but they had no lineage. And there was this sort of recreation and fiddling around with the lineages and and religious aspects of it to make eclectic witchcraft, traditional witchcraft, American traditional witchcraft, Appalachian granny magic, and all these different little groups, you know, Mm -hmm. family traditions and and so forth. That did not happen in the African-American community. They just basically stay Baptist. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The reason being that there had never been a condemnation of magic so strong in the Baptist church. Now, Church of God in Christ and some of these other black denominations were very anti-magic. Leaving those aside, Jehovah's Witness, there's a large number of black people in Jehovah's Witness, and they condemn Mm -hmm. magic, like all the Jehovah's Witnesses do, including the white ones. But leaving all that aside, and I'm just talking about the the majority of, of black families in America know some of these tricks. And they, they practiced them, and they, there was no uh, Calvinistic thou shalt not push against the magic part of it. So there was no need to, quote, change religions to a magic accepting religion. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Absolutely. So, so what happened is um, uh, kind of just the same within the Baptist faith or, or any of these assemblies of God or some of these, you know, some of these rather unusual small denominations of um, black churches. And the spiritualist church and the spiritual church movement. Spiritualist churches now are usually defined as white. Spiritual church movement now usually defined as black, but those are flexible, very flexible in these lines. Mm-hmm. But spiritual church uh, had a large uh, component of black uh, participants uh, starting in the 19th century, and the spiritualist churches stood up for abolition of slavery, and they stood up for uh, universal suffrage, including of African Americans and women. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of spiritualist churches that are black spiritualist churches that pra- openly practice magic, and my church is modeled on that mm-hmm. style of di- doing divination, doing readings for people. Mm-hmm. So um, those types of, and, and those would be sometimes referred to as Christian spiritualist churches. Um, and some of them, like there's even one one denomination, Metropolitan Church of God in Christ. I mean, it's like, Metropo- excuse me, Metropolitan Spiritualist Church of God in Christ. It's mm-hmm. like, whoa, that tells you kind of where they came from and what they held on to, you know. Mm-hmm. So all of these denominations allow divination, allow spiritual practice. Some of the Christian churches did not, and so the people who felt more magically inclined broke off into neo-pagan groups. Mm-hmm. And they have their own historical reasons for wanting to do so, to honor their own ancestors, and that's great. Mm-hmm. I have nothing against that. But yeah, a lot of them are are coming into hoodoo or conjure what I call, I call them spell skimmers. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They right, come in and skim the spells off. Right, they 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 want to get get the recipe uh, without yeah. necessarily. Yeah, I want learning. the recipe. I want the formula. I want the layout of the candles. Bye. Right, and they don't necessarily want to uh, to take the cooking course necessarily. Right, they don't necessarily want to make friends with the cooks either. Mm-hmm. Oh, and that's a great want, point. And in some cases, they tell outright lies about really? where they got the re- things from. I mean, where the where the spells come from. Um, and and this is not only true of hoodoo. I have to say, Silver Raven Wolf, and I'm going to be very blunt about this. Did this just recent with. Um, with powwow, or I, mm-hmm. with the powwow stuff, which is not called powwows, but it, like it, it's called brah or I, or, right. or um, trying for, for you know, someone, hex and craft, you know, or mm-hmm. uh, whatever. She did this, and she quote returned this to its roots. She put in mentions of the goddess Bridget and things like this mm. in what were obviously German folk magic that was German Catholic Christian folk magic, mm-hmm. and I found it shameful of her to do that. Mm. Shameful. Those people were not Irish to be gone. What would they be doing with Bridget anyway? Mm. You know, this, and if she wanted to go back, she should have gone back at least to some Bavarian, Southern, Teutonic. German Catholic, yeah, you know, German Catholic traditions. But she didn't even do that. And and in fact, those people have not been 
uh, pagan in many centuries. They identify as what they are. And when you buy a book like Powell's, it says make the sign of the cross three times. It means make the sign of the cross three times. Mm -hmm. And it's not her place to tell those people that, that she knows their culture better than they do. And I found that shameful. And what I'm afraid of is that people are trying to do this with, with African American root work. Mm. And and saying, I'm going to return this to African deities. I'm sorry. I didn't learn of anything about African deities when I learned this in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And the people I learned it from didn't learn anything about African you know, Sure, yes, every once in a while. Somebody, my grandfather was from Africa. That's very interesting. And your grandfather did this how? Well, you know, he said, you know, you want to say this and say, make this on the cross. If he was Catholic or if he was Baptist, he would say, you know, and uh, you ask this in Jesus' name. You know, I mean, it's, it's what it is. You cannot, cultures are malleable and changeable. And the farther back you go, we all end up in Africa, right? I mean, all right. of our DNA comes from Africa. But we're talking about honoring ancestors and ancestral lineages. We should keep those clear and not just make porridge out of them. Mm -hmm. you know? Anyway, end of end of uh, rant. No, that's wonderful. I really appreciate you you, you saying that. It's it's something that um, I, I think people don't think seriously enough about that, and and it's it's really refreshing to hear that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you in my shop, I sell you know statues of Ganesh, and I sell statues of Lakshmi, and and Tara, and Buddha, and I have uh, Sho, and uh, you know the, the Chinese star gods, and mm -hmm. I have you know. Um, Nang Kwok uh, from Thailand, and I have Jesus, and I have Mary, and I have, uh, you know, statues of all these gods. And uh, I have, you know, those who do not make statues, I have the, you know, the lettering of Allah, and, the, you know, things like that. And, and, you know, all of that things I have so that everyone feels at home. Mm -hmm. I once met a man who was born Muslim, but he sold Hindu uh, gilded print cards and he was from Afghanistan, and he taught me a prayer that he himself knew to be Zoroastrian, a prayer that went with the herb Aspant. And he said, this is Zoroastrian, but we Muslims say it. And when he told me he was Muslim, and I had just bought some Hindu cards from him, I said, well, if you're Muslim, why do you sell the Hindu things? He goes, I sell all the popular gods. <laughs> and he said this with this great, great Afghani accent. And I just, I loved it. And so that became a slogan for um, our shop. We carry all the popular gods. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered, what would you do with the unpopular gods? No, <laughs> but we do. We, we carry them all. We have things for Thor. We have things, you know. And our idea is everyone can be friends. However, I don't, uh, I don't expect, uh, and I will teach you, if, hey, if you need to know some little um, Jewish book magic, I can teach it to you. The, the hoodoo is, is what I became uh, associated with mainly, as I said, because no one was doing it at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I, and I still have a lot in my brain to download. I'll keep on downloading it for a number of years. But there are many, many other things that I, I serve all people who wish to study indigenous ethnomagicology. That's why we call it the preservation and popularization of indigenous ethnomagicology. And I don't put one above another, mm. but I do want people to understand you can't just pick and choose. Mm -hmm. And and nobody nobody can say to me, oh, Lakshmi, she's just like the Virgin Mary, except she's on a lotus. A lady actually came into my shop and said that. Mm. And I'm like, yes, from one perspective, you could say that. But at the same from time... from another perspective, very wrong. Right, you're dismissing an entire, you know, thousands of years of cultural history exactly, by doing that. Exactly. So. I mean, I would say she's more like the Virgin Mary than say Brahma is like the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you know, there's so many different things. There's so many different cultures. Let's look at them all and enjoy them. It's like food. I often make what I call the cooking analogy. If I want to go to a Mexican restaurant, I want to have Mexican food, mm -hmm. right? Now, there are fusion restaurants, you know, Asian fusion restaurants, and they're making this kind of, you know, it's part Asian, part French cuisine, and maybe a little bit of Mexican, this and that, and the other tossed in, and it's fusion cooking. It's fine, but I like to know about what I'm eating. I want to eat food that comes from a culture that I want to learn about that culture. I may want to go there. But I, I'll be happy if immigrants from that culture bring a restaurant of that type. When I go for dim sum, I want it to be 
real dim sum. You know what I mean? Right, you want to be in Chinatown. Yeah, well, (laughs) actually, we've got a great dim sum here in Santa Rosa, California called (laughs) Hang Ah Dim Sum. It's in an old A&W root beer uh, stand. No kidding, right off of 101. Check it out, Hang Ah Dim Sum in Santa Rosa. It's perfect. It's beautiful. It's as Chinese as they come. And it's really Chinese. It is not McDonald's. You know what I mean? Right. It's not TV culture. It's not mall culture. It's real dim sum. And so I go to them when I want dim sum. And I hope that people will understand that when you do that, though, you got to, you know, you got to pick up a little bit on what Chinese culture is. Mm-hmm. You know? And you even... Gotta, even using that cooking analogy with the fusion, the chefs who do fusion and do it well have been really well trained in each of the individual branches. Right. They, they know how to do French. They know how to do Thai before they right. ever try to blend them together. That's right. That's exactly true. Now, I mean, we would all wish that the chaos mages of the world were as intellectually uh, inclined, but they, they're not. <laughs> and they tend to, I mean, it, 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 Chaos Magic was once a very powerful force, and I, I endorsed it at one point back in the in the 80s. I thought, this is interesting, because that was the magical equivalent of fusion cooking. But what I found out was that Chaos Mages ended up being often just going to a lowest common denominator, mm-hmm. and it ends up as porridge again, you know, mm-hmm. just porridge. You know, and one of the interesting things is every culture, just to talk about cooking again, every culture that I've ever been able to find out about has a dish that contains a concentrated protein, um, either egg, cheese, or milk, Mm -hmm. uh, or meat, um, or fish, some concentrated protein, and wrapped in a carbohydrate envelope. Mm, Like a pierogi or an egg roll? Pierogi, a ravioli, Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, bao, it is dim sum bao. Mm-hmm. Uh, every culture has one of these. Um, there's one called fufu in Africa, which is they're just was made with cassava. Um, there's all these different cultures have made this. But if I'm going to go get fufu, or if I'm going to go get um, paroshki, or whatever I'm going to go get, it's not going to be the same as ravioli. Mm-hmm. You see. It's not going to be a Cornish pasty. It's going to be something different. And chicken pot pie, it's always something different. But um, it would be wonderful, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to go to a food court and they say, this is the food court of the protein and wrapped in <laughs> carbohydrates. And you could just go for wontons, you know, mm-hmm. everything. You would have, you know, pot stickers. It's all here. Right. Just put it all on a tray and sample each one. Be great. Yeah. But each one's different. Mm-hmm. And and there's, a, there's so much history and there's so much pride of continuity of keeping these cultures alive. And... Um, you know, and a hamburger happens to be one of those things. Oh, you've even thought of that, but that's that's <laughs> <Yeah>. great. <laughs> but we shouldn't always all eat hamburgers. Right, right. Um, to to hit a fun topic really quickly, uh, I've heard that you were the official consultant on a on a movie about uh, hoodoo called The Skeleton Key. Yeah, I was. So, yeah. What was that experience like? It was uh, interesting and frustrating. I, I've worked with other movie companies too, and done other kinds of consulting. So it was, it was, you know, it was interesting. Um, the the screenwriter had never been in a conjure shop before in his life. They mm-hmm. sent him up actually to come here. He was a very nice young man. I said, so how many conjure shops were you in to research conjure shops? He goes, this would be conjure shop number one. At least he was honest about it. Right. Um, he he had some ideas that were just. I don't know, they were eccentric. He was a good screenwriter in that he wrote things that he thought would play well on camera, but they didn't necessarily have anything to do with Conjure. So, um, for instance, just, and again, I'm not trying to put him down. He was a very, very adaptable, very nice young man. He wanted there to be a spell, and he was going to use a, he wanted it to have water. There was a theme of water. I don't know if you've seen the movie, there was mm-hmm. a huge theme of water. And the filmmaker was, uh, the director, rather, was building and amplifying this theme of water constantly running throughout the movie, raining and Mm -hmm. water. So he wanted to make a scene that the writer did in which there was a a bowl of water with a candle, and it was going to be a spell with water running down. There was going to be a chant that was going to involve water. And so he decided to have a floating candle. Like I was like, Hmm. what is this? Like Martha Stewart's (laughs) living, you know what I mean? (laughs) We'll have that little floating candle. You know, he didn't know, of course, Think about it. Floating candles. First of all, that's whipping air into the can. You know, that, that's just, this is so seventies. You know, these mm-hmm. floating candles, the patio light floating candles, and even candles in Hoodoo only date back to, uh, you know, the refining of um, petroleum into making um, 
you know, commonly made candles because before that everyone used kerosene lamps and mm -hmm. whale oil lamps or whatever, lard, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. you, you know, oil lamps, you know, you just have to think about this and we're the floating cat. So, so I said, all right, well, we're going to make it be urban hoodoo. Let's make, let's use a crucifix candle and put it in a bowl of water. We could do that. So I actually made up a spell because I couldn't tell him a traditional spell because it didn't have this candle in the water. Mm -hmm. They needed the candle in the water so that it, so that the actress could drop it and it would it would break and fall and it would be a, a scary moment. Mm -hmm. See? So what I did was take what they needed for drama and then warped it back toward hoodoo as it really exists. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It's really good to know that. Yeah, so that's not an authentic spell, but I did the best I could with the, with the dramatic constraints. There was another thing. There was there was a thing where she... Did. We needed to get clues that these people who were the, um, the evil people mm -hmm. had switched bodies a number of times and that in previous life, they had had black bodies, and so there were supposed to be little clues along the way, which there were. And one, it was a scene where she was this elderly white woman who was actually an elderly black woman in a white woman's body, um, was supposed to kind of give away a little bit, and she was asking the young heroine to get help her with her gardening. And so I, ha I inserted that she used a name for a plant that was an African American folk common name for the plant and not a an anglo-american folk name oh. so that if you if you were aware of it if you were aware of it you would get the you'd go wait a minute that name that she shouldn't be using that that's black and it should make you actually go huh you know mm -hmm. um and so because it was a, it was a tell it was a giveaway so i i just peppered this the thing you know with all these kinds of little bits like that. We also supplied them with thousands and thousands of dollars of, of um, Lucky Mojo uh, products. Conjure, conjure shop things for a scene that lasted less than 10 seconds. Yes. I mean, they just sort of ran the camera right by that, which was funny because we really, I mean, we out, basically outfitted them with an entire hoodoo shop. Oh, that's... But they didn't use that. They they just sort of ran right past it. Mm -hmm. So, and I also, I think I was responsible for, and they accepted it very early on, the line that this is not voodoo. And we, we worked on the writing of that one little, again, like two sentences. This isn't voodoo. This is African-American folk magic. That was inserted. And then another thing that was done, the, the screenwriter, again, uh, a young white man, had no idea about black music and he had um he came up with this whole idea of these old recordings these field recordings which was a very clever idea it was wonderful but we had to displace the time originally it was set in a certain time and we had to explain that, that time wouldn't work for those recordings and so they changed it around mm -hmm. um and that, and that was good that all worked out just fine but then there was a little bit more having to do with the song he wanted to have this music this recording uh and um he called it call and response oh. and uh, and the way he had written the song was not call and response uh he had written a white style of of uh, white gospel which is actually called um call and echo it's different than call and response mm -hmm. um do you know what I'm talking about in terms of music? Again, I'm a musical yes. obsessive, so I expect everyone to know. But I, for instance, like, like uh, it, call an echo would be, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, see that conjure man shed his skin, and then the the echo is see that conjure man shed his skin. Right. right? Whereas call and call response and is call and response be see that conjure man shed his skin. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh Lord, oh Lord, it's something right. different. You mm -hmm. see, it's a call and a response, and he didn't know the difference. So he had written this rather long piece of music lyrics that was supposed to be this thing and when when i they flew me down i, I gave a lecture there i was there for a day um they flew me in basically to talk to the art department and talk to the director and talk to the music librarian about what we were going to, to do to bring this kind of make it more authentic so with them and the music person was there the, when i went down the director's um assistant was an african-american young woman and and I, I was sort of interesting. I said to her, what did you think of this screenplay? And I didn't want to get her in trouble or anything. I just was private. And I said, what did you think of the screenplay? And she said, well, it's got a few problems. And I said, yeah. I said, I think that's why they called me in. I said, bear with me. I said, you know, I'm not black, but I think I know what, what we can do to help this. And she was like, well, she goes, I'm, she goes, this is my first big job. I said, I understand. No, we're not going to get there. But, but I did do something funny, and I consider it a funny story, which I will tell, you know. Uh, so I'm trying to explain to this English director, this man's British, right, mm -hmm. to this English director who's done a beautiful, beautiful movie, prior movie on the history of the Beatles, 
mean, this guy did really great movies. He was really neat. But he didn't know a lot about American culture. And I said, the difference between call and response and, um, and, uh, and, call, and, and call and echo. And I said to her, I just turned to this young black woman there and I said, if I was to sing a song to you and you were to do call and response, could you, do you know what I'm talking about? She goes, yeah. I said, and I just said to her, Jesus on the main line. And she said, tell them what you want. And the director, he was very intelligent. He looked at that and he goes, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but it just, you know, some, I was brought in there as an expert, but I didn't want to, quote, be an expert. I wanted to show them, though, that they needed to delve a little deeper into the things they were playing with. Mm -hmm. it, it was just a fiction. It was a horror right. movie, you know. But they needed to, so that was my role. I just simply kind of kept them focused on African-American culture. That mm -hmm. was it. Well, excellent. Well, I enjoyed the movie, so so thank you for for all your contributions to that. Well, yeah, you're welcome. Sure, and I I, I gave them a CD of a whole lot of songs I you know put together, and you know I, I I mean I really did. I I brought them a lot of homework. Is what I did. I brought them a lot of products and showed them how to use them. I showed them how to do a bathing ritual. You know things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. Well, I hate to monopolize all your time, so I, I guess we should should wrap up here. Um, well, yeah, we've 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 certainly talked for quite a while, and uh, you know me, I'll talk forever. I, anytime I love you it. want to talk to me again, I'll be glad to. Wonderful. Um, if people want to find a, a root worker nearby, do you have any tips on how how they might do that? Well, a lot of root workers work by mail. We do have a group of these are people who are graduates of my course and um, and have at least two years practice root working, and you can find them at Air. Association of Independent Readers and Root Workers, which is a, a run by Missionary Independent Spiritual Church, an outreach to mm -hmm. the uh, uh, client community. These are all root workers who have um, taken an ethical oath not to rip people off, and we have an ombudsman if you have trouble with anybody. And it's at readersandrootworkers.com, which is all spelled out, readersandrootworkers.com. Or you can find it by going just to rootworkers, with an S on the end, rootworkers.com, or you can find it by going to Hoodoopsychics.com, <laughs> right. and um, and that is org is another way to find it. We we own a bunch of related sites, and there's names. There's about uh, 22 people who are very good workers, and they're all around the country: uh, California, uh, Ohio, Texas, um, you name it. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Georgia. They're all around. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we will definitely have links to that in the show notes, as well as links to uh, to Cat Ironwood's wonderful shop, yeah. LuckyMojo.com. And can I put in one more plug? Just yes, a bit? One absolutely. Little bit. Um, my, my good friend, Dr. Keone, at, mm -hmm. uh, at uh, DrKeone.com, he and I have had a radio show for many years, and we're starting our own new season on September 9th. 19th. Wonderful. And that's the, yeah, that's the Lucky Mojo Hoodoo Root Work Hour. And it's a call-in show. It will be every Sunday, 3 p.m. California time, 6 p.m. Eastern time. You can call in and um, ask questions about your own case. In other words, we take people's cases and give them some suggestions about spell work they can do and prayers they can say. And that will be me and Dr. Keone together again. Great. Uh, is there a website for that? Well, that, you can find that through Lucky Mojo or okay. through um, My Hoodoo Space, uh, which is uh, .com, which is Keone's site. And uh, you can also find it through the Lucky Mojo Forum, which is forum.luckymojo.com. And we have a forum where you can ask questions about who to do and stuff. Great. Whatever. And uh, well, I know that some of those were released as podcasts. That's how I, I, I've listened to a lot of yeah, them. Yeah, these, these will be podcasts also. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Ms. Ironwood, thank you so, so much for this interview. I really appreciate it. Sure, and thanks very much for having me. Wonderful. Good luck with you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hello, this is Firelight, creator of Inciting a Riot, the podcast. Come join the riot as I tackle tough issues in paganism, news, and living a modern, magical, middle-class life. Find the show on iTunes or become a rioter by following the blog at fire-lyte.blogspot.com. Inciting a Riot, lighting a fire under comfortable thinking. Hi. 
Hi, this is Meadow Moon, and you can find me at A Pagan in the Threshold, where I will be discussing mostly pagan-related topics. I'm a work-from-home, homeschooling mom of two located in South Carolina. In addition to that, I'm a case manager for a local paranormal group, and I have a bachelor's degree in alternative medicine. So I think it's pretty safe to say that we'll have plenty to talk about. You can find me at MeadowMoon.com and on iTunes. So I invite you to join me as I hit rewind on my pagan beliefs and start back at square one. So that was the lovely, the brilliant, the articulate, and the intelligent Cat Ironwood. Uh, we will be posting links to all the various uh, sources of information that she mentioned in the interview uh, in our show notes. And uh, for now, if you're looking for her main website, you can go to luckymojo.com and uh, find pretty much everything she's ever written, either on that site or through that site. Uh, all very brilliant stuff. And we really appreciate uh, her being on and giving us that interview. Yeah, definitely. I really wish I could have been there for it. Um, but, you know, it just didn't work out, but that's okay. Why weren't you there? I why, Eileen? Why? I had to work. <laughs> when we needed you the most. <laughs> I know. You failed. I know. Like, one of our biggest interviews, and I, I had to work. But it's terrible. What are you going to do? <sighs> so, anyway, we wanted to uh, discuss the interview a little bit. You know, some of the points she brought up. and um, So, yeah, let's get to that. How was it interviewing her? What was it like? It was really nerve-wracking. I'm going to be totally yeah. honest. That is the most nervous I've ever been for an interview. Were you starstruck? I was a little starstruck. Because I know you really have learned a lot from her. Not, like, yeah. directly, but, you know, through books and her website and everything. Yeah. I mean, she's been sort of the the, the overall guiding force in my education on, on particularly hoodoo. Mm -hmm. um, if, if for no other reason, then she points me to a lot of other good sources and other good books. Mm -hmm. and. and you know, teachers, of, of course, as well. So, so yeah, so very nerve-wracking to yeah. talk to her. Yeah. Thankfully, like, she has done this sort of thing so often that mm -hmm. really I, I just threw a couple of questions out there and she ran with them. Yeah. So that was great. I really didn't have to, to, to worry too much about sounding like a complete idiot. <laughs> Not like, that you do, ever. There's only like 30 seconds of me sounding like an idiot, and then the other like 55 minutes of it is is her being amazing. <laughs> so. What about you? How is it, how is it listening to it? Did you, what did you um, react to? I was very struck by some of the history that she gave. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating. We were talking about it earlier, but uh, I'll repeat it now. <laughs> um, yes, please do. You know, just that it's it's stuff that you probably could have figured out for yourself. But like you didn't really think about. I know I didn't. What, you know that you know slaves came over. They had particular ways of doing things with you know roots and plants over there, mm -hmm. and they come over here and there's not any of that. They're still expected to do this healing and you know other things. <laughs> and, um, speaking of sounding stupid, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so, and having to adapt and it's just and pulling from you know. The Christianity and the Native American, and it's just... And all the very yeah, all the various things that had to come together in that, that salad, yeah. as she put and it. and I'm sure there were, um, there were other, there were different tribes that all came together, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, from, like, North Africa and South Africa, you know, you're going to have two different ways of doing things, and that's got mixed in. I just think it's fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it was, it was a, it was really kind of a, a good history lesson, a good yeah. education. Yeah. So, and you heard it here, folks, at New World Witchery. Oh, <laughs> um, so what, what else struck you? Um, I loved when she talked about the movie. That mm -hmm. was fun. Hearing about, you know, her having, her going in and being like, no, you can't do that. And then the, the spell that she made up and. Yeah, that was awesome, wasn't it? Like, yeah. I totally thought that was a legitimate real spell when I saw that movie. Really? Yeah, totally bought it. Wow. Hook, line, and sinker. Well, I mean, it makes sense. You know, she has so much knowledge of it that she could make one up and it seems very real and it was well well done fooled me <laughs> i loved it um you know it's one of those things that well you know she's got all that background and she's done her her homework mm -hmm. in it so so she's able to take those building blocks and turn it into something that looks so real yes which is really neat agreed I, I loved the part where she was talking about the uh the assistant the the set assistant the african-american set assistant mm -hmm. who 
you know, she talk, she's talking to her about what was going on. The set assistant's like, yeah, I, I've never seen that stuff before in my life. And then Kat's like, well, what about this? She's like, oh, no, that's real. <laughs> she's like, yeah, that, that's what I'm going to go tell them right now. <laughs> so. And the callback and the echoing stuff. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I've never done any of that, obviously. But, like, when she said it, I just sort of knew what she was talking about. I was like, well, echoing and call, you know, that makes sense. Why would they not get that? <laughs> yeah, well, honestly, I think it has something to do with being Southern. You think? Yeah, because, I mean, a lot of gospel music, and I mean, you can't live in the South without at least bumping up against gospel music every once in a while. I mean, yeah. it's it's played on radio stations here that are, have nothing to do with gospel music sometimes. Yeah. Um, so you, you hear that a lot of gospel music is either call and response or call and echo. Mm-hmm. So, so you can't avoid it, uh, and I think that just has to do with being being southern. You've probably encountered that more than more than you realize. It's one of those things that like must be. I don't. I've never heard that that phrasing though. But right, I and, still know what she was talking about. So. Right, and that's just it. Is I think probably you know did you ever like go to church with any of your friends when you were little? Mm, yeah, occasionally, but it, we didn't really sing anything like that. Mm-hmm. Well, you but you said you went to church, you went to church of Christ. You yeah, but it, it was all, it was all hymns. Right, but, but those hymns are call and response sometimes. I don't remember any of them that are. I just remember, you know, a couple. Mm-hmm. We kind of stuck to the same ones. <laughs> mm-hmm. And plus, whenever I was there, I was miserable. So, so not a positive. Experience. I tend to block it. The songs was about the only thing that I liked. So, mm-hmm. my yeah, my wife is a big fan of the uh, the hymns at her at her church, which is also a Church of Christ. And uh, some of the, like the, I don't, I love to, I wish I could think of an actual hymn that's a call and response Me hymn. Me too. But, um, but I know that a lot of times they'll divide them so that the men will, will have the call and the women will have the response or vice versa. And, and those yeah. are always really interesting. I think it's so pretty. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's all acapella, of course. Mm-hmm. So it's beautiful. Ah. Anywho. So let's. Never heard hopes. Yeah, but the, you, you know, you've never heard so much about Christianity and, and him <laughs> singing on a, on a podcast about witchcraft. Because yeah, we've talked about this before. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Um, we we don't have to talk about this. We can totally cut this part. But do you want to get into some of the a little bit more of the controversial stuff that she talked about? Sure. Um, Let's throw throw it out there. And if yeah. Not, then I've got a gap there. Okay. Yeah. Well, she uh, you know, she brought up having to be comfortable with Jesus. Uh-huh. And um, what what did you think of that? What was your take on it? I'm totally on board with that, but then again, I am. Right. I mean, if I'm going to church with my wife every Sunday, then... You're obviously comfortable I'm okay with it. with it. See, and I'm not as comfortable with it, so I don't know. I wonder what her reaction to me would be. I don't know. I mean, you'd have to obviously ask her yourself. But... Yeah, I mean, and I'm not saying, like, like that's a challenge. Like, oh, come on, cat, bring it, you know? Like, right. <laughs> I don't mean it like that. I'm just, I don't know. I think she has had a, a number of healthy, stable interactions with pagans and neo-pagans that have been very positive experiences. So mm-hmm. I don't think that that she would come up come up to you and, and just be like, oh, you're a neo-pagan or you're pagan, and and therefore you have no place oh, in no, any of this. Oh, no, I don't think I don't that think either. she would ever be, be that way. I think what she would say is if you're really going to study hoodoo, if you're really going to make the most of it and not not just use it as sort of a... Uh, an archive or a mine for spells. Mm-hmm. But if you're really going to get into it, you're going to have to be really comfortable talking to and interacting with black people, which is a huge part. I mean, the course that she does is, is there's a whole, uh, one of the whole modules is basically you just go and hang out with, with African Americans and, and talk to them about their family lore. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're not doing it just so that you can get their family lore, but just so that you, you understand that that's part of, the, the hoodoo background. Right. And where they're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. You get the social context of it. Yeah. Um, and then you also need to be comfortable with Christianity because Christianity is, it was sort of the bowl in which that salad was made or, or, or you know, it was, it, you know, it's one of the kinds of lettuce, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a pretty big component. You can't, you can't, uh, study who do without coming up to Christianity and without being comfortable with a little bit of Christianity right. mixed in there. Um, but that being said, I personally think that you can do who do without praying, you know, praying to Jesus as an exclusive entity without praying to, without, you know, praying to, to God as a, as a singular, you know, Jehovah in 
Old Testament wrathy kind of way. Right. Well, and, you know, you could make the point that hoodoo is not a religion. It's a magical system. Exactly. So. Yeah, and you, I mean... You don't want to. You don't want to put stuff there that doesn't belong there. Like she was talking about with Silver Raven Wolf's mm-hmm. Hexencraft uh, book, or what did she call it? Maybe Hexcraft is what she called it. I can't remember what she called I it. I can't remember either. Um, Silver Raven Wolf calls it powwow. Right, but there, uh, she calls what she does powwow in the book, but the book itself, I think, is called Hexcraft. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, and she actually even has a little podcast that she was doing for a little while. Uh, I've only heard a couple of episodes of it. Um, and it's not available on a regular stream. Like you have to kind of dig for it. But, uh, but a lot of the things she does, like she was saying, you know, she'll throw in, you know, a Celtic goddess, like, like breed mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, who, yes, because of the Catholic connection, you could say, okay, so she became a Catholic saint. Therefore, when she's brought into this Teutonic area through Catholicism, maybe she gets adopted into the Germanic lore, but it's a stretch to do that. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying that I I know that I don't know that that's what Silver Raven Wolf did. I have no idea. Right, we haven't read the book. Yeah, we have no idea really how that all is structured. Um, but that's something to be careful of. Yeah. You know, you don't want to start doing hoodoo and then just assume that you can instantly bring in ISIS. <laughs> well, actually, I would say ISIS would be more okay than others because ISIS is an African deity. It's Egyptian. She's an Egyptian deity. But at least that's African. There might be a reason to go back there. But you'd have to you have to find that. You have to actually do the <laughs> research to, to make that work. Um, but you know you wouldn't Quan Yin. Quan Yin would have no place in in Hoodoo. Well, I say that, Dad Gummit, <laughs> because there is actually an Asian like a the, like the Chinatown influence right. on later Hoodoo. I could see it connecting that way. Gosh, who wouldn't Thor? There we Thor go. Has, Thor has no place in Hoodoo. <laughs> If you're using Thor and Hoodoo, no, stop right now. Bad. Bad. No, no Hoodoo biscuit for you. Um, I, I, if you, if you are and you can explain why, that's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, but no, so like Thor is completely alien to anything that, that Hoodoo grew up in. Right. So why would you bring Thor into it? But you wouldn't bring Thor into it. I don't think you would. No. So... And when you do hoodoo, you're not like that's something I think w- with your hoodoo. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. On this, but um, when you're doing hoodoo, spirits don't enter into it a whole lot. No. God's spirits, entities don't enter into it a whole lot. No, I do it very much as a magical system. Mm-hmm. So well, yeah, you're right. And I would say I do it as a magical system, <clears throat> but the spirits do enter into it. So it's, but they're not, they're not particularly religious spirits. They're just sort of spirits <laughs> they're like people but some people would consider that religious some would I, I just don't right so so anyway but but i know i want to know more about you so when you do your hoodoo without the spiritual context can you explain that a little bit no <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what you mean like well okay um I'm kind of putting you on the spot with this. Mm-hmm. Um, Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. <laughs> well done, Corey. <laughs> but okay, so so you were saying that you think that she would be like, oh no, you know, bad, bad neo pagan. No, no, I don't think she would say that. I think she wouldn't accept me into her class because you have an issue with Christianity. I, I don't even want to say that. I'm just not comfortable with it. I grew up in it. It it's it made me just guilt ridden and it made me feel awful about myself mm-hmm. and I just don't like it for me. I don't mean like, I don't like the people who do it. I don't like it as a religion. I just mean, I don't like it for me. So I do think she wouldn't accept me, Well, but that's okay. Like I'm not saying, Oh cat, I'm so sad. It's just, you know, you're, this isn't a desperate plea to try and get into her class. Right. You don't need to get into her class. No, it's just, I don't, you know, just f- from what I gathered from her yeah. interview. And, and I don't know, this is something I'd, I'd be interested to ask her if we ever have her back on. Um, but I don't necessarily know that she wouldn't accept you into your class if, because, like you just said, you don't have a problem with people being Christian. You don't have a problem with anybody around you being, you wouldn't have a problem talking to a Christian person about their magical practices. Right. It, you know, but where, so where does, where does that come in for you? Where is it like, where's the cutoff for you? Um, Praying to Jesus, <laughs> okay. Um, you know, using Christian saints, you know, anything like that. I just it doesn't do anything for me. It feels 
fake to me. Okay. Okay. That makes a lot more sense to me now. All right. All right. So you would feel kind of like you were a poser. A little bit. If you were trying to use, but, and this is, this is something I'm curious about. Okay. Like, for example, if you had someone that, that you were doing a house cleansing for, Mm -hmm. right. And you knew that they worked with primarily a Celtic pantheon and they were pagan and you were trying to help them do something. And you don't really work with Celtic deities no. yourself. Uh, I know that you used to work a lot with Egyptian. Is that right? No, I was interested in, I did some like research on it, but I never worked with, uh, it was, it was, it was more Greek. Yeah. Greco, Greco-Roman. Kind yeah. Of, yeah. Cla- classical. Uh, okay. This may, I mean, some people may want to take my pagan card after this, but a lot of times I wouldn't assign any, like, I didn't have any specific pantheon. I just sort of was like, you know, god and goddess, and it was, they just were, you know, they weren't any okay. particular one. Okay, but if somebody, well, okay, that's interesting, because I think that you could really be comfortable with Christianity in that respect. Really? Yeah, because because you you also sort of believe there's sort of another level above that that's sort of the all. Yes, right? yeah, I do. Well, that could be God. <laughs> yeah. Christians call it God. Yeah, that's true. So, but see, I see God as part of that. That whole, but that's just a terminology. Yeah, that's, I, very, that's very true. Um, this is getting very, very complicated. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, no, I just think that's interesting because I think that you could come at it from a point of view of, you know, if somebody had a Celtic pantheon that they were a really big fan of, you probably would tell them, "We'll pray to your Celtic pantheon." You would tell them, "Pray, you know, pray to the god and goddess that I'm telling you to pray to." Would you? I don't know. <sighs> I, okay, if I were to do a, a cleansing spell, I wouldn't say, okay, let's pray together. And, you know, I would say, I'll do my thing. If you want to do something else, you you can. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you pray to who you pray to, and I'll pray to who I pray to. And I think that would be fine. Yeah. But it wouldn't be like, okay, you know, uh, we'll pray to whoever you want to. Be, because I, if I wasn't comfortable with that, I wouldn't feel like it would be as effective. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm wondering, though. Like, because, and I understand what you mean about the, the sort of feeling f- fake with prayers to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Because clearly that... You know, that could be crossing the line. Yeah. But I don't know. Like, I think, like, you could go in there and be like, I want to pray to who I'm going to pray to. You pray to who you need to pray to. And we're going to do these things and get this house clean. Right. And I think that's basically the same thing that Cat would do in Hoodoo. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Like, that, we need to have her back on to discuss <laughs> that. Very interesting. Yeah. I just don't know. But yeah, I, I I hope this doesn't like come across as like I have a problem with anything she said or or yeah, I'm upset or anything like that. I just think it was very interesting and I thought it'd be fun to talk about mm-hmm. because it's kind of you know controversial a little it bit. It is, and yeah, I think we'll <laughs> definitely get feedback on that. Yeah, I hope I hope we do. Yeah. It may not be positive, but <laughs> well, that's I okay. It. Um, so. it can't all be positive. That's okay. Yeah, and we've learned that you hate Christians. <laughs> that well, she's eaten like six of them today. It's true. It's sad. <laughs> She, babies, especially. Just so tender. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> Delicious baby. <laughs> Delicious Jesus baby. Nom, nom, nom. A picture. Jesus has a six pound. <laughs> Eight ounce baby Jesus. <laughs> I like the Christmas Jesus. <laughs> oh, yeah, we just quoted Talladega and I. Yes, we did. Oh, uh, goodness. In an earlier version of this, we quoted Ratatouille. So mm-hmm. we're doing real well on citing legitimate yeah, we sources. We were having a problem with this conversation tonight for some reason. Yeah. Third time's a charm. Yeah. Charm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, I guess that's it. Yeah. Anything else to talk about? Uh, I don't think so. We hit the movie Salad. Discussed Salad, yes. <laughs> I think so. All right. So yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah, I guess we'll take a break and uh, come back with um, with Witchcraft. Get all nice and soapy. Yay! All right, we'll be back in a minute. Okay, so today in Witchcraft, we're going to be talking about soap making. So to get started with that, you would... um... We probably should clarify, first of all, um, when we're saying soap making in this particular segment, Mm -hmm. you're not going to take them through how to, you know, render render lard. Why? Why water? No, we're doing a quick and dirty, simple way. Yes, this is a very easy way. And if you want to do it the hard way, <laughs> you know, like with the have a hand in every single thing, then that that's totally understandable. But information, I'm sure, is online. 
So. Or I'm sure somebody will do a blog post about it eventually. Or that, or Corey May. So <laughs> this is the, the quick and dirty way to do it. So you can buy blocks of make your own soap um, at what craft stores, yeah, stuff like that. Um, and they'll be in uh, like you can get goat's milk or olive oil, like really good quality stuff. Okay, cool. Yeah, I should point out to, before we start, Corey has done this. I haven't, so he will be chiming in occasionally on this, which is totally fine. <laughs> um, so okay, you're gonna get your own uh, soap, and then. You, you're going to cut it, you know, into the size that you want. It's usually pre-scored. And um, then you melt it, and you can either do it over the stovetop with a double boiler, um, or you can melt it in the microwave. And that you want to do at about 50% power with, uh, you know, 30-second intervals until it's melted properly. Mm -hmm. It would be kind of like a thick soup. Okay. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish I could have done that with you. We'll do uh, do a soap-making day at some point. That'd be fun. Especially now that we've come up with our new idea with it. Yes. It'd be fun. So anyway, um, so you can, and also you can add oils and herbs. And this is probably what's going to make it like, you know, magical soap. <laughs> so, you know, add the herbs that you want. Um, I know Corey did one that had uh, verbena in it, mm. I believe. It was very lemony scented. Yes. And that one was great. Yeah. So, and that would be a really good cleanser. Mm-hmm. Just, um. Magical cleanser, spiritual yes. cleanser. Yes, it's like you talked about last, um, last spelled out. You know the the lemon. There's a reason why mm-hmm. so many cl- cleansers are use lemon because mm-hmm. that citrus is a cleanser. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, and you can also add oils to it, um, but the oils you want to wait for the soap to cool just a little bit, or else it's going to evaporate too quickly. Mm-hmm. So keep that in mind. Once it cools down just a little bit, you're going to pour it into the molds that you have and let it set. And, uh, and and also, if for some reason you want to add some food coloring to change the color of the soap, you can certainly do that okay. too before you pour it into the molds when you're adding the essential oils. Okay. Some people might not like that because of the artificialness of and it. And that's but, totally fine. I'm just saying if, that, but if I that's can your see bag. That. But, you know, but the, the color might be great for, you know, certain correspondences that you might need. And exactly. It won't stain your skin or anything, will it? Mm-mm. Okay. No, because you're not going to use, one, you're not going to use very much, but just a few a few drops, maybe, you know, five to ten, would, would co- color a whole batch of soap, a nice light color. Okay. So. So you have a lot of things that can... I guess, influence how it works. Like, like we said, the oils, the herbs, and then also, you know, you can pour it into different shapes, um, for the molds. And that would, what am I trying to say here? (laughs) I lost it. It might help like guide the the purpose of the the sort of spell that the soap is designed for. Yes. Like if for some reason you were making like a, you know, your sort of witchy pre-ritual soap, a star. Yes. Like that's what I was thinking. Star Mm -hmm. stuff. But you know, then you could just do squares and have it be, Mm-hmm. Just regular soap. Um, another idea that Corey had, which I thought was really, really interesting, um, is to put a, a stone in the middle of it um, while, and let it dry that way and, you know, use it until you get down to the stone. And so that stone is going to, or crystal or whatever you want to call it, um, is going to, I guess, uh, imbue the soap with its mm-hmm. power. That sounds really, really floofy, but... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a little puffy. Yeah. But, but no, like... You know, if if you do work with stones, there's no reason you couldn't add that to the the soap. I mean, you'd want to make sure it's not a stone that decomposes in water. Yeah. You know, you want to make sure it's one that you don't mind getting some damage, getting wet. But there are plenty of stones that you can do that. Then you also want to make sure it's not one with a lot of jacket pointy bits. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Look for something round and tumbled. Yeah, get a tumbled one. <laughs> so... Yeah, that's that's soap making. Is there, oh, you had another uh, little hint to give. Oh yes, when you are when you've got them in the molds and you're letting them uh, cool and dry, and it'll take. It, I, I would generally say let them sit overnight, you know, in the okay. molds uh, to to really set. But while they're doing that, right after you've gotten them poured in, if you get a little spritzer bottle and put some ethyl alcohol, not not isopropyl, you want the kind that's made from natural grain as opposed to petroleum. But you uh, you take that alcohol. Uh, Vodka, good strong vodka, will do this too. Put it in your spritzer bottle, and from a good distance away, just sort of spritz the back of all the soap and the molds, and it will keep the little tiny bubbles from forming all over the the backs and making your soap look funny. It'll, as the alcohol evaporates, it'll pop those bubbles. That's really cool. It makes them nice and smooth. Hmm. So it's very cool, and the alcohol won't do anything after you get the soap. What the alcohol's gone, so. So before we wrap up, um, what are some of the herbs that, that you used in yours? Oh, snap. You totally turned it around. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, obviously, in the, the, the cleansing one, um, 
was the lemon. I used lemon. I think I may have used Van Van or no, I used I used Verbena essence and I used no, I'm sorry, I used vetiver essence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I used lemon balm and then pieces of lemon peel and lemon uh, essential oil as well in there. And that was like a good, like, strip it all away, get it all off of you right. kind of thing. And I did one, I did one, and this is good. Either people will laugh at me or they'll be like, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> I totally made a mint oatmeal. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> because I wanted to see if it actually was effective as a shaving soap. Because it's what they talk about in Practical Magic. And I, I knew it was you were really going to say that. <laughs> like, I'm totally making this to see how it works. And it's a great shaving soap. It's amazing. Is it? Yeah, because the mint stimulates the skin and the the oatmeal helps like get rid of dead skin. Slough it off. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Slough. Uh, Slough. Uh, nah. My husband uses some uh, that has eucalyptus in it. And... Mm-hmm. um. But he, like, shaves the old-fashioned way, you know, not with, like, a, not a Sweeney Todd razor, but, like, the next generation of those. Right, the where, old straight razors. Yes. Um, not straight razors, there's the old uh, safety razors. Yes, exactly, where you actually replace the scary blades that people use to commit right. suicide in movies. That's <laughs> a horrible way to think about it. But uh, anyway, so he has to have, like, a shaving cream that, mm-hmm. you know, you take the, the badger hair brush and you, mm-hmm. you know, mix it up and everything. So anyway, he uses this shaving cream and it has eucalyptus in it and it, um, it, so, you know, it opens your pores mm-hmm. and then, uh, so yeah, that, that makes total sense that it would mm-hmm. work. Yeah. It, was, it, it seemed to be pretty effective. Very cool. Um, and then I did one that had lavender and ginger, which is just sort of a, a warm, loving, friendly soap. And that mm-hmm. didn't really, I didn't do that one with any magical significance. I was just doing it because I like the smell. Okay. Well, you could do lavender for sleep. Yeah. The ginger probably would not be a good compliment for that. Probably not, though, because that's more, like, awake. But... Yeah, you could do lavender and chamomile, though, mm-hmm. pretty, very easily. Or lavender and vanilla. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we'll take another quick little break, probably just long enough to play uh, the intro music, and then I'll be back with Spelled Out. All right, welcome to Spelled Out. Today, uh, sort of apropos of uh, Lane's soap segment, we're going to be talking about spiritual cleansing baths. Uh, Now, one of the primary sources for what I'm going to be discussing is a book called Spiritual Cleansing by, and I'm probably going to butcher this name, but I believe it's Draja Mikaheritz is his name. Um, He's a... sort of an occult scholar who's done dozens of books on magic. They're all amazing. Um, and they often have a lot of hoodoo in them mixed with a good bit of Eastern European magic, which is very interesting. Um, but anyway, so, uh, the baths I'm going to be talking about are baths designed to do basic spiritual cleansing. This is the kind of bath you would take if you're just wanting to go back to neutral you want to get rid of any negative stuff that's hanging around you. Uh, also good for you know prepping yourself uh, in the event that a ritual is coming up. So you could use it as a sort of a, a pre-ritual bath. Uh, I'm going to give sort of three variant recipes on this. The first one I'm going to give is probably the simplest. And it is uh, also one of the ones that may be... Uh, so maybe easiest on this on the skin, uh, but um, but don't do this if you have very very sensitive skin. If you do, if you have very very sensitive skin, don't do any of these without talking to your physician. I would say um, just because you don't want to have a breakout. Uh, the simplest form of a good spiritual cleansing bath involves um, simple apple cider vinegar and salt. Hmm. That's it, uh, and you'll use. Um, just, uh, just a little handful, not even a full handful, just like a little palm full of salt and like a jar full or a cup full of apple cider vinegar. And what you want to do is you want to put the salt into the vinegar and stir it up to mix it and then pour that into the bath. And, uh, and when you're taking a ritual bath, the way you want to do it is you want to get into the bath with the ritual mixture put in there and you want to make sure that you completely submerge yourself at least once most Workers recommend uh, doing it three times or seven times, some nine times, 13 times. Right. 
Um, you take these baths at dawn uh, or at sunset if you can't do it at dawn for some reason. Why Why those times? The threshold times. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, you know, it's the times when, when spirits are most active in, or spirituality is most active. Uh, and I'll go through the recipes a little bit more before I get into the ingredients in these. But the idea is that by submerging yourself and completely covering yourself in these things, they will strip away anything harmful from you and leave you clean and pure. Um, when you're done with these, you should air dry. Right. And these are not designed to be cleaning baths in terms of your daily shower. If you if you need to take a daily shower, take your daily shower, then take a spiritual bath. Okay. So you want the spiritual bath to be the thing that air dries on you. It's the last thing that happens to you. Um, and they only take a few minutes, really. You know, they're, they're not that, that detailed. You just want to make sure that you get your head covered and cover your body. Um, so do you just, you just submerge? Like you don't have to kind of scrub yourself or rub the water on you or anything like you can that? can if you want to. Okay. I mean, the, the idea is really that you're just going to get in the tub and make sure you completely submerged, come back out, stand back up, go back down in. It's, it's you Just imagine like you're in a river, just dunking yourself. Okay. That's what you're really trying to do. Uh, okay, so the other variants on this, uh, you can also do one that involves using water. Preferably you can use either holy water or sea water. Those are both excellent. Uh, again, another little palmful of salt and about a teaspoon to a tablespoon of ammonia. If you have very sensitive skin, don't do this one because ammonia could irritate you and don't use more than a tablespoon. I mean, even in a full bathtub, you want to be very careful. Um, ammonia is an amazing spiritual cleaning agent. It does a beautiful job of getting rid of negative things. Um, there are root workers who recommend when you're doing your ritual house cleaning, one of the last things you do is you take a spoonful of ammonia and dump it down every drain in your house. Huh. It gets rid of everything. Make sure everything is clean. Yeah. So you use that uh, to do the same kind of a cleaning. Uh, and then the other variation is, this one's a bit saltier. This is sort of a, a way to replicate seawater as a cleanser. And you use, you know, a good jar full of baking soda, uh, which is also known as bi bicarbonate soda. You use about a palm full of table salt and about a palm full to a handful of Epsom salts. Um, all of those are available at your grocery store. Anything that I mentioned here really is available at your grocery store. Salt, of course, is a great neutralizer. It will absorb and scrub away almost anything, You're sort of replicating a sea, sea bath. If you think about the ocean sort of drawing away in the way that a tide draws away, pulling things out of you. So that's how that, that works with the salt. The ammonia, again, very, very powerful cleansing agent. That's really all I have to say about those specific baths. If you have any questions about those, please feel free to write and ask. If you want the specific recipes, I'll uh, try to post those online as well at some point. Right. And I'm sure we'll have the, the book in the show notes as well. Yes, of course. Um, so, yeah, that's it for uh, Spelled Out today. Awesome. All right. Well, um, again, we really want to thank Kat Ironwood for being a wonderful guest on our show. Yes, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you to all of our listeners and uh, and readers at the blog. Mm -hmm. We've gotten some really good feedback. Hopefully we'll get around to, to reading and responding to that specifically. Um, I'm still still struggling to keep up with, uh, with some of the correspondence. So if I haven't responded to you yet... Um, I, I will. Just give me a little bit of time to, to get to it, and, I, and I, I will do my best to respond to everybody who writes um, until that becomes unmanageable. <laughs> but that shouldn't happen anytime soon. Um, but if you want to write to us, our email address is compassandkey at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. And there's the blog, newellwitchery.wordpress.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and feel free to drop by anytime. Leave a comment. Yeah. Oh, before we sign off, uh, I'll mention this, but there is going to be, or there are going to be, speak English, Corey, <laughs> um, a series of concerts coming up called Strowler Nights. Um, and I'm going to post information about this on the blog for everyone. Um, the first concert is going to be held in St. Louis uh, on September 10th, 11th, and 12th, I believe, uh, from 7 p.m. to midnight, featuring artists like S.J. Tucker, um, Tricky Pixie, mm -hmm. Wendy we've, Rule. We've talked about Tricky Pixie on yeah. our, uh, our media yeah. episodes. They're just so much fun. Yeah. I mean, if you get a chance to see them, they're 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 great. Um, it's just this big like carnival esque event. It's it's not quite a concert. It's not quite a sh uh, you know a uh, a, 
floor show or whatever. Mm-hmm. It, it's sort of a mix of a lot of different things. It's it's almost like a the Bonnaroo. Or the I was Woodstock just thinking. Of, it sounds like is. Bonnaroo. <laughs> so um, if you get a chance, it'll be in St. Louis on September 10th, 11th, and 12th, I believe, 7 p.m. to midnight. Uh, there will also be festivals uh, in Boston and uh, Seattle. Um, so please check those out. Again, I'll be putting information about this on the actual uh, show notes. Uh, sometime in the next uh, couple of days after this is out, so everyone can get a chance to see that. We have a special promotion going on right now, uh, sort of in conjunction with Straller Nights. If you want to see one of these shows, can go to their website to pre-order tickets, and if you enter the discount code AIRTIME, that's A-I-R-T-I-M-E, you'll get 10% off. So, awesome. Yeah. So that's just uh, something nice that they're doing, and uh, we just want to pass that on to you guys. So please check that out. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you go to see that, I'd love to hear about it. Which it's not really near enough. None of them are really near enough that I can go see them myself. Yeah. But, but they just sound amazing. It sounds like so much fun. So, uh, yeah. Well, uh, that'll about do it for this show. Yeah, thanks for listening. And be well. New World Witchery is recorded using GarageBand on Mac. The song you're listening to is Homebound by the artist Jag from Cypress Grove Blues. It can be found on magnatune.com. Magnatune, your source for podsafe music. <laughs>